Hello everybody. The subject of today's episode is Peter Power, an artist who fellow painter A.H. O'Keefe later remembered as a jolly old Irishman. I'm not sure whether O'Keefe meant Power was both old and jolly, or just jolly old. I guess he would have been about 60 when O'Keefe knew him, and apparently that seemed old to O'Keefe at the time. Peter Power was actually born in England to Irish parents about 1830. He studied art as a lad and then following in his father's footsteps, adopted hat making as an occupation. In 1853, like so many others, Peter headed off to the gold fields of Australia. He passed the time at sea by producing sketches, much to the delight of his shipmates aboard the Albatross. He would later recall that when the Albatross arrived at Hobson Bay, there were 78 vessels at anchor there, many of them abandoned by their crews who had scarpered to the goldfields. Likewise, Peter Power was soon living in Ballarat. There, he's said to have been involved in the uprising of the miners that culminated in the Battle of the Eureka Stockade in December 1854. In 1860, we see him still in Ballarat, working as a hatter, but also being described as a local artist when some of his work was shown at the Mechanics Bazaar in December that year. With the outbreak of the gold rushes in Otago in 1861, it's likely that Peter and perhaps some of his brothers joined the mass of diggers and others flooding into Dunedin. He married Jane Amers back in Melbourne in 1862, but the couple would come to live in Dunedin. And they'd called Dunedin home for 30 years. And during that time, they'd raise a family of eight children, one daughter and seven sons. As he had in Ballarat, Peter went into business as a hatter, but also began to make a name for himself as an artist. This oil painting is likely one placed on display at Dunedin's Shamrock Hotel and described in the local newspaper in August 1862. It was described as showing a portion of the town as viewed from the Barrack Hill, which explains the red jacketed soldiers pictured in the foreground. The newspaper reporter wrote that it was the first oil painting of Otago scenery they'd seen. They were keen to speak of it in favourable terms, but unfortunately they couldn't, because in their opinion, although the drawing was good, the aerial perspective was all wrong and the colouring was defective. Not wanting to discourage a beginner in art who evidently has talent, they added that they were hopeful he would overcome the difficulties of colour and distance with his future efforts. It would seem Peter wasn't discouraged by the criticism. In 1865, his works appeared at the New Zealand Exhibition in Dunedin. In 1866, his occupation given in post office directories as both hatter and artist. And in 1867, he's listed as an artist and photographer. Also in 1867, when the Fire Brigade, the Odd Fellows, and the operative tailors marched through the streets of Dunedin during the Friendly Society's fate, the Tailors Union carried a handsome new banner that Peter Power had painted for them. The banner depicting Adam and Eve, the world's first tailors on one side, and a sheep on the other, would be treasured by the tailors for many years to come. This banner wasn't the only one that Peter Power was called upon to create in 1867. The young ladies of the Band of Hope Temperance Society raised funds for him to paint a banner for them too. Theirs featured abstinence mottos and native scenery. And banners weren't the only large artworks he was asked to make. He was also known to have created scenic backdrops for stage productions. In 1869, Power exhibited in a fine arts exhibition in Dunedin. The reviews of his works shown there were mixed. From a pretty picture with a well-painted sky and an admirable bit of character painting to ones that were judged as hard, crude, flat and indiscriminately coloured without due regard to harmony. In the following decade, Power continued to improve his reputation as a painter. 
when the Art Society was established in 1876, he became a regular exhibitor there. He also began to teach others to draw and paint. He entered works in the Sydney International Exhibition, which ran from September 1879 to April 1880, and the Melbourne International Exhibition, which followed. At the end of 1880, we see Power staging an art union of 38 of his works, valued at £350, over $70,000 worth in today's money, from premises in Dunedin's Octagon. This was quickly followed by an auction of 53 of his works at the beginning of 1881. But times were tough. Unable to cover the rent on the Octagon premises, his stock of paintings, hats, hatters, tools and so on was seized by the bailiff and sold, and Peter relocated the business to his home in Leith Street. Throughout the 1880s, he continued to produce a large number of works and exhibited widely, including at the Colonial and Indian Exhibition in London in 1886, and at the Melbourne Centennial Exhibition in 1888-89, and at the New Zealand and South Seas Exhibition in Dunedin in 1889-90, where he was awarded a third order of merit for one of his works. Later in 1890, we see Power quitting his studio in High Street and selling his home in Leith Street. Having made his mark on the art scene in Dunedin for three decades, Peter Power would spend much of the next three decades in Australia. In 1898, one of his paintings, depicting Dunedin in its infancy, was displayed as part of the celebrations to mark the 50th jubilee of the founding of Dunedin. The operative Taylor's banner, that he had painted back in 1867 and repainted before he left Dunedin, could also be seen as the pioneer tailors marched in a jubilee procession. By 1918, Peter Power, then in his late 80s and a widower for 20 years, was said to be still actively engaged in painting pictures at his studio amid a tea tree grove in the Melbourne suburb of Hampton as if the advance of time had no meaning for him. By now, his youngest son, Septimus, who had been born in Dunedin in 1877, had become a successful artist too, and was widely known for his work as an official war artist for Australia during the First World War. Peter was said to have been greatly affected by the death of his eldest daughter, Annie, in April 1920, and the jolly old Irishman himself passed away a few months later. He was later remembered in Dunedin principally as a landscape painter who had a fancy for painting the big black pine trees that once grew prolifically in Woodhaw Valley and on Pine Hill. And although he never drank alcohol himself, he was also remembered for throwing a party whenever he sold a picture. See you next time and thanks for watching.